are what we call live load tests. This is what sometimes you'll do when you walk on a fire escape, thinking, let me go check out what this is. You'll, you'll never walk on fire escapes again. From the ground, you'll be able to look up and see certain evidence. And what's called all you know evidence of repair, which is if you see nothing but square heads and rivets when you look up, has that thing ever been maintained? If you look up and you see all new bolting that is hex heads, has that some attempt at maintenance thing? So you're gonna be as you walk around now in your city and you keep looking up and you keep seeing rivets and square heads. What you're gonna be able to see from here is if you were actually able to look down, just how much rust is in every connection. The average rust, because of some of our cases that we did, takes 25 years to grow a quarter inch of rust unchecked. This is a case we're doing in Iowa where some students were up here watching the fireworks. Two guys and a girl, basically the, that fire escape fell on the roof, fell to the ground. What happened here is the maintenance guys were fixing that fire escape. To do the, the siding, they took the fire escape off that was through bolted, and then they latch screwed it back into the building through the holes that were the through bolts. So this is us when we found the smoking gun. They basically took all the pieces of the fire escape and put it like six blocks away and they looked like the That's how they, they you know detected the evidence, you know. But we got lucky we as we were pulling up all the pieces, what do we find hanging out of one of the brackets? That bolt we photographed it. Then they put it right back. And when they put it back, now they were so scared of not doing it correctly that not only did they through bolt it, but they also put a leg. But the photographs that we have, the leg, which is a tube, four by four, is right into the shingles, you know, right into the roof shingles. There's no footing there, there's nothing. And this piece over here, which didn't have legs before, so that was what's causing all the torquing, in the corner there was a hole for a bolt that they didn't put in. So we were able to videotape ourselves going there. We actually grabbed that and walked it one to two feet in one direction and then brought it back and just dropped it back in. So a lot of times without engineer oversight, basically what you have is a vendor driven situation where they do what they think is best. So when you have a florist and a landscaper basically, you know, doing this kind of activity, you're gonna get this. Because their main their main job is hiding it, hiding it with paint, hiding it with caulk, and getting a check from the client. This is the, some more live book testing. How many times do you have parades? Firemen, this is where a lot of times for some reason a fireman can't get through the front door and they have to get somebody evacuated out, the, out through a window. So firemen are constantly putting themselves at risk. Back in the day when there was no AC, we would think everybody slept. And, and by the way, uh, one of our guys out of Chicago, uh, this is not a picture of his dad, but his dad was doing this work and he fell seven stories. Basically cut the wrong clip and it fell seven stories. So who does this affect? Anybody who touches it. Building inspectors, fire inspectors, tenants. We're trying to pass a new law in this, you know, the national fire escape reform. We're trying to pass a law that all rent now should be collected through the fire escape by the landlords and the management companies. So that every tenant now just basically puts their envelope on the outside of the window and then calls in and says, hey, your check is here, come and get it. <laughs> and it's all, you know, they can only access it through the fire escape. I think we're gonna get a, a change in the, so, and, and so this, this is some of the things that we're dealing with when it comes to live load testing. And people have done all kinds of crazy things now. Weddings are now taking place on fire escapes. Uh, students can't smoke in the building. Where do you smoke? Can't keep candles. Can't keep pots uh, uh, and plants. Where do you keep them? Where do you grow your tomatoes? Where do you keep your bicycles and your, and your cans, the five cent cans? So who inspects fire escapes? Nationwide, the, the codes are very clear. Structural engineers, and sometimes a registered engineer. So our code is not doesn't specifically say structural engineer. It says a registered professional. So they really rely on you. Do you accept you know a civil engineer or a landscape engineer or somebody that's registered? You accept them. In uh, in some states, a registered professional also means architects. Who chooses that? You do. You're going to choose. The code says uh, registered professionals are others acceptable to the building officials. So you may want to choose other people. Some people think you guys are inspecting these fire escapes. You, you were just there last week and you didn't say anything wrong about my fire escape. Why are you picking on this? Well, like, because my, my building inspector was just here, but he didn't, he didn't pick on any of this. Why are you giving me a hard time? There's fire escape inspectors. The only ones that are inspected, there's actually two licenses available in the country. 
One is that in Boston, Boston gives you a G3 license. And a G3 license is a, a license to, uh, to put up window guards and railings and fix firescapes. And do, else, do, do what else? You can also now inspect firescapes or examine them in the city of Boston and some other cities in and around that allow you to. And you can also sign off on them. So in the city of Boston, a lot of these firescapes, the 8,500 firescapes are being signed by who? <coughs> Structural engineers or vendors? Vendors who are working with a repair permit or a paint permit? Paint permit. So that paint permit that I can sign off on my own work, any, any room for abuse? All right, so the G3 has also gone out into the, the surrounding area. You know, to the city, in some cities, so permits are being pulled a lot of times with the G3 license. Certificates are being signed by G3, and because it's vendor-driven, was there some abuse? You bet there was. There's a evidence of it. Why? Because it was easy. If I can just paint it and collect the check, you think I'm not working and collect the check, or I'm just going to paint it and collect the check. What school uh, system was this from? Let's see. I'll uh, I'll point it down to uh, within Cambridge. Well, I mean, it was on the Cambridge, uh, you know, Somerville, Arlington, Lyon kind of thing. But it was an elementary school, private elementary yeah, school. In Washington school. We have a bunch of old schools in the city, a lot of you guys do, and we have fire escapes. So part of what we do when we do our annual inspection, and they're doing it slower. But there's all kinds of pressure because the city is funding these things. They're not pushing, but just as you said here, we got kids. In some cases, they're just secondary. They're not used daily. But they're there, so it, you know, sooner or later something to use it. We don't have any this bad, but there are some that we have to do some repairs. But I'm concerned about the schools that have it. The uh, couple of schools issues. One is uh, the law is very clear. During a fire drill, which is twice a month, one announced, one unannounced, you're supposed to use the closest exit. So you're actually supposed to be putting these kids through these fire escapes for them to get used to height the issues. Nobody ever does. They'll run them 100 feet in the other direction, and a lot of times because they don't trust these fire escapes. And charter schools, charter schools are occupying buildings that were never schools. And so sometimes the fire escape on the charter school, old office building, they have crossover balconies and ladders. So whenever charter schools, they're supposed to, uh, there was a change in use, they were supposed to change the fire escapes to meet the egress as if it was a school. So. Be aware that some of your charter schools need to upgrade their fire escape systems because they're not the code. And very few charter schools go into old schools. They go into basically a, a building complex somewhere, and that's where they basically take over. Okay. When you say not to code, to what code? Well, when you do a change of use, again, the building inspectors will tell me sometimes they'll make you bring it to current code for the trails, you know, 711 rise and run, or you got to bring it. To the code that was at the time, meaning you know the the fire escape, you know you're not you're not forced to change the uh, a fire escape that has a ladder to uh, to a staircase because it's an existing commercial building. But as soon as I put a school in there, now I have to take that ladder out and I have to completely stay up to the ground. Because a lot of times these uh, these exterior egress systems, you know, they don't have the rise doesn't have a solid right. and how you get to the ground. Every inspection is going to be discussed back with you with photographs. Yes, to basically close up some lines in some of these parallel uh, rail systems that they have and basically at least reduce the liability associated with that. But that's what an engineer inspecting it with photographs back to you because everything's supposed to come back to you during the examination. The code is very clear. Examine, test, certify, right? This is a fire escape just from where you're sitting right now. Pass or fail? Right? I got a call from a secretary. This is down in Fort Lee. This building is actually where the um, uh, the East Coast Hollywood in Fort Lee was, believe it or not, was the East Coast Hollywood for the silent movie. All the silent movies were done in this place, which is now a big warehouse storage place. But she called me because she got a letter from an engineer that said, in reading this letter, it basically says, fix one tread on the fire escape, unbend one piece of slide on the, on, the, on, the, on the platform, and give it a paint job and I'll sign it. But he has a disclaimer down here. That when you read the disclaimer, it says, this was, this was not a low test, this was, you know, this is my opinion. Yeah, we came in and we condemned the whole fire escape system. And these 
are all red markings of all the violations. Now, this is a secretary. Now, Fort Lee and uh, in New Jersey and the tri-state area, we actually teach through Kane University. We teach a six-hour continuing ed course mainly to fire prevention. So we have taught at Sayreville, Camden, Bergen County. And this is like, we teach this class just to fire prevention. It's six hours. And, and now Fort Lee is, they attended one of the classes. So now Fort Lee, like Lowell, is a model city down there that says, no, we have to do something about it. And they take the three to five year program, which is, you know, to not upset the apple cart. They're identifying fire escapes and on, on a one, two, three fire escape rhythm, just starting to get to know just how to handle this because you're going to get a lot of blowback, tons of blowback. And you sort, of, you sort of have to have a plan that is identified first, secure it second, and then fix it third in a yeah, proper way. We won't way. accept the NAFTA David from an engineer. We've had several attempt it that has that qualification where they claim they have no knowledge of the existing mounting system yeah, yeah. well then the letter is useless because that's critical. Right. They, then, and then your confidence test that you have, that's one of the lines. That's one of the questions, number 19. It says, how did you verify the, the connection? Did you open up the wall? Did you take a little hole uh, back here and basically open up a little one-inch hole and throw in a snake and photograph it? I mean, there, there's ways to do it. You're just choosing not to do it. So don't say you can't do it. You can. And it's done every five years. So you can either just open up some holes on the outside. You can tell, and we'll show you examples of us doing the verification process. This is another one. I was in Chicago and uh, looking at a building over there, and they already had a structural engineer stand, uh, a letter on it. They said, fix a few little things. I went there. And this is unique in that on each corner, there's a, a bar that goes back to the building with a through bolt on the top. So instead of having legs underneath it or diagonals underneath it, it has a bus. So it's suspended. And at the corners here is basically you got a rod that comes down and then it was threaded and then a big nut, you know, holding the, the ends. And, and the engineer said everything was fine, just give it a paint job, fix a few things. And we basically uh, sent these photographs back to the ownership. It says, uh, Sure, you want to fix some of these things? So, this is again engineer opinion versus a confidence test. An opinion is who do they send out that day? Do they have their coffee or not? What are they really looking for? A confidence test, which is in your book, and we're going to cover the book in a second. A confidence test asks them specific questions. So, the liability starts to rest on them when they answer yes no questions. This is out by Worcester. This is the detention center on Route 9. Kids 17 and younger. So, and this is into a courtyard, a closed courtyard for them to either recess or whatever. When you first get to it, you know, the fire station looks bad. When you get underneath it, so this fire station is going to either hurt the kids, hurt the, the people watching the kids, hurt the firemen trying to get in the building to save the kids. It takes 25 years to grow a quarter inch. This half inch. This is, all, this is another school down in Jersey by the shore. So, Ross, it's guaranteed. You give it the air, you give it water, you give it time. What are you going to get? If you don't properly maintain it, when you maintain a fire escape, when you maintain a piece of steel, all you're doing is s stopping or reducing the amount of time it's going to take to wither away to nothing. <laughs> You'll never keep a piece of steel forever. You're just going to reduce how long it takes. So you keep it painted, you're going to make it last 100 years. You don't keep it painted, it'll last 25 to 50 years. That's all. But it's going to wither away. Eventually, you're going to have to change that piece of steel outside because it, it just can't handle it. So the main thing that you guys are going to be concerned about, firemen or building inspectors, is the fact that there's an unknown. When you stop walking up these things, this is what occurs. Yeah, this kind of rust. This is an inspection and a hammer test. So as we walk up this thing, we have a simple three-pound hammer. And that's just so we know whether or not we can continue with the inspection or not. But imagine you're going up to take a peek at this fire escape, or a worker is going up to, to do something, or you're coming down. Going up is one thing. You're going to get hurt. Going down, you're going to break one of your limbs in the wrong direction, and then you're out forever. Because knees will bend backwards, knees will not bend forwards. So if your leg gets trapped and your body motion is still going, so uh, some firemen know that some of the biggest accidents or some of the, uh, a lot of the uh, injuries, the simple injuries that happen to firemen, isn't it fire escape uh, treads giving way or trip, trip hazards that happen on fire escape? 
Now, we did a case where a fireman fell through this fire escape, and we'll, and we'll, we'll go through it, but let's just be clear. We're not making it, we don't need any new code. It already exists. We're trying to tell you that the authority having jurisdiction shall accept by low test or other evidence of strength. So we're trying to tell you that the fire department and the building department and the housing code has in their back pocket the word low test. And that, uh, that a, an engineer is going to go out of his way to provide you other evidence of strength, which is a refurbishment of a fire escape. A fire escape that is built within its first 25 years, you think you need to change the bolts? Within the first 25 years of a brand new fire escape? None of it's been maintained. It's probably maintained. How about between 25 and 50 years, do you think there, that there's, there's a bolt change coming? Because in that building, in 50 years, have they changed the windows? Have they changed the roof? Have they changed the boiler? Have they changed the bathrooms? Have they changed the fire escape? No. No. So the average lifespan of a bolt is 25 to 50 years. Swap out the bolts, keep the steel. And the beauty about steel is that the, the middle of steel never rots. The, wherever it joins and pools and collects bird poo and, and, and leaves and stuff, that's where it rots. So if you change all the connections, and did they have silicone 50 years ago? So if today you change all those things out and you inject 50 years silicone in those joints, tar, and it's going to stop have water from getting back there, you basically have a fire escape that for the rest of that lifetime of the building should be just a paint job problem. And then if all of a sudden a fire escape is properly repaired, all the joints cleaned, sealed, rebolted, can the owner just keep it painted for the rest of his lifetime? Does he need a permit? To do what? To paint it in the future. So he goes, we basically just reset the dial on the thing. So after it gets fully refurbished and properly certified by a structural engineer, now the owner can just keep it painted. So he can paint it, his brother can paint it, he can call a landscaper, anybody to come and paint it. Why? Because you basically seal all the joint. This is connection management. That's all you do. What you can see on the outside and then connection management of what's buried in the building. Can you find those? Yes, we can. We'll show you how. So, yes. The International Building Code, what section is that? The International Building Code? This is a quick uh, snippet of your 1001.3. 1001.3, and it's in your code, if I may use this book for a second. And well, let's, 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 let's use this time now just to explain what's in your book. And it'll be referenced throughout. I'll tell you how this happened. Right here, what you have is what we call a repairs and procedures and guidelines. At the very bottom, you have the building code. The mass building code says, all exterior bridges. Any fire escapes yet? So what is a bridge? What's an exterior bridge? Is that a porch? Is that a catwalk? Is that a handicap ramp? Right? All exterior, so all exterior. Um, steel or wooden stairways, what's that? That's everything, that's decks. Front stairways, back stairways, porch, porches on the back, a deck with a stair off the back, all exterior still wooden stair, and like you said, cement, which is not listed here, but it's a common sense that the cement must be maintained in good order. We mentioned fire escapes yet? Let's go to the next. Fire escapes and egress balconies. What's an egress balcony? Porch. It's a porch. Is an egress balcony also one of those Romeo and Juliet de decorative balconies that hang on certain buildings? And people can use that as an area of refuge, waiting for a fireman to get down? Okay, so we don't have to inspect uh, exterior, uh, exterior um, we call them Romeo and Juliet balconies. They really don't serve any purpose, up, but they basically, if somebody's going to wait there, if their if they're, uh, you know, apartment's on fire, where do they wait? Where well, there's fresh air, and who gets them down? So shouldn't that platform on some of these complexes that have all these cement pads and no way to get out, that, who gets those people up, up to seven stories, right? Seven stories? That's the average height now, right? For the fire trucks? There's no way out. It's not a means of egress. I'm not calling it a means of egress. I'm just calling it what it says here. It's an egress balcony. An egress balcony is a place where people can get egress from. They sometimes call it uh, area, of area of refuge. It's a place you gotta wait while <laughs> you're screaming and yelling, help me, help me, and ladder show up, truck show up. Um, shall be examined, or tested, and certified for structural adequacy and safety every five years by a mass registered professional engineer or others qualified and acceptable to the building official who shall then submit an affidavit to the building official. 
the affidavit has been in the past a letter on their letterhead. The affidavit in the past, if you were using it in Boston, has been a document that they created that some other ships copied, and it basically says, to the best of my information, knowledge, will be able to the to conform with the mass building code. That's all it says. So, what are we going to talk about today? We're also going to talk about lead. EPA 2010 says you can't burn anything that has lead older than 78. You need your renovator's license. Just so you know, any contract that can go for eight hours on a weekend can get that class. Even. As long as he attends it in the morning, by the end of the day, he gets this piece of paper. He then gets the privilege of, of giving $300 to the EPA and registering their firm with the EPA. But they have this little license that says, I know how to wear the little white suit, the little plastic gloves, and the little mask, and I can you know, put the plastic down and collect all these chips from the building or from the fire escape. So that's the renovator's license. By the way, you guys know these guys. This is OSHA. You know what OSHA says about EPA? They totally disagree with them. What are you talking about? You're not protecting the workers. Whether it has no lead or low lead, you know, we're going to start finding these guys that we show out there because where's their blood? Blood draws. Where's their 30 years of, uh, of medical records? And they're exposed not only to lead, they got asbestos, we got all kinds of problems. And the, one of the biggest problems out there for OSHA is the iron workers field. And but yeah, but this is the ornamental guys, you know. They're worse. <laughs> they don't follow half the rule. They go up and fix these fire escapes off the ladders, no, no harnesses, no nothing. So OSHA just stepped in. We were on a nice 10 story building in Pittsburgh, and guess who showed up? Because they had nothing to do that day. I guess they're not building any other buildings that day, and we're repairing a fire escape. So a lot of times you need to have your OSHA 10 certification. And when you, when you take that OSHA 10, my God, there's things in there you're like, that. So here we are complicating because this is a lot of this fire escape work is done by mom and pops. Mom and pops who don't have the EPA license and don't have their OSHA. Okay, we'll talk about that. Confidence tests. You have examples. These are these are examples of the confidence tests done by here by Lowell. All this is is a confidence test that we pulled that we generated for um, Seattle. Seattle called me out to do a class just like this. Was it before three guys fell off the building or after three guys fell off the building? So when we got there, we basically came in and explained what's been happening nationwide and that the eyeball testing is, was a critical, so we created this exam. So we generated this, this exam and basically, if you go to seattle.gov, you can actually download. You go to Fire Prevention and down there in their, you, you know, in their website, you can get a sprinkler uh, test, you can get a alarm test, there's all kinds of testing uh, examples. And basically, you can just get it as a PDF or a Word document and change the word around, put your name on it. That's all. So this is an industry standard now that some, uh, you know, some states, and we've had a, a lot of great results. We live in the tri-state area. Also, it's all places, Washington and, and uh, or, um, Oregon, Portland. We actually had success last year that in 2012. They actually adopted our system and changed the, the Oregon building code to reflect these standards. So one state down in, what an antigo, but they're on the other side of, on the other side. But um, before I go any further, let's talk about what this is. I was actually in a class, um, I live in Westboro, and there was another class that we did out further, out by Springfield, and we had, a lot of these classes have a state fire marshal. So we had Gene Novak at yours, we also had another gentleman out, and basically we were talking about what can we do to basically help um, you know, in getting some of this uh, information out there. And he basically told us, he goes, listen, if all fire departments and building departments have what's called repair procedures and guidelines for everything, for, you know, solar, for, uh, you know, septics, for everything, and they basically use on their letterhead the little write-up, like what we would like you to see here and do, and it just makes it easier for the permit process, and they explain in, in general terms what to do. And so, in speak with that state official, uh, state inspector, he goes, if you design a, a generic explanation of what to do without mentioning anyone, without mentioning exactly how to do it, you just, you just make it a generic statement, you then can create an inspection regime for an inspector, you can, you can have an inspection regime for the repair guys, and you can have an inspection regime for the painters. You put the guy's name at the top, such as the building official. We send this, we send this to Bob and say, hey, you can either use this or steal things from here and put it on your own letterhead if you don't want. But otherwise, we can send it to you in PDF or send it to you in Word, and you just put your, your name here, or Kate will actually do this for your city and put your information on top. And all this is 
is just a generic thing that says, hey, you're an engineer, the city wants you to examine it and give them a copy of the report and talk to them about it. That's all it says there. Do not just do the report, you know, for example, in Seattle, you have to have a preliminary report. You don't have an ending report. That's all you guys are getting here. A structural engineer is called by the beginning of this job or at the end of this job? The end. To do a drive-by, to look up at a black fire escape that's still tacky and wet. You think he wants to walk on that thing? And he's going to give you that disclaimer certificate anyway, right? But in Seattle, you have to have a preliminary confidence test. So you actually fill this confidence test twice and you provide it back to the official. The confidence test says, hey, I found it, it's bad, it's got problems. And you're supposed to have photographs, so that's what this thing says. This says, oh, if you're going to do repairs, there must be an engineer of oversight. So if anybody's going to repair it, the city wants to know who's the engineer of oversight that's going to take control of the project and see it two or three times during the, during the repairs. And then there's a painting part of this that says, if you're going to paint it, are you aware of the EPA guidelines? So when you read these three, and we provided this, and this is something that you can have on your desk, on your countertop, you can have it on your website, and whenever somebody asks you the common question, what do I do? Well, there's three people that are going to be involved with you. There's going to be an inspector involved with you, a repair guy involved with you, and a paint guy, just send one of these, or they can come to the, top, to the counter and grab one of these. Got it? Okay, confidence test. Everything is pretty simple. It's yes, no on every specific component of the fire escape, including the cantilever and the drop cantilever and the ladders. And also, yes, number, I think it's question number 19. It says, are the connections of the anchors into the building sufficient to support the required load as verified by methods acceptable to the structural engineer? It means verifiable. Open it up. Go into a building and through the sheetrock, put a little hole and bury that little, uh, that little, um, you know, that little wand that uh, you basically photograph. If not from the outside, just drill some holes next to the steel and start doing sampling all over the place to see if there's been any water damage. This is a typical examination. What you're going to want, which they were not, never providing for you, is when you're speaking with somebody about a fire escape that's three miles away, you don't have to go out there and see it. The, the engineer is supposed to provide you with some documentation so you can just look at it. Got it? The next thing that we talk about is this came uh, up to us and uh, we shared this with Bob, and this was a document you already have from the state. It's basically, they call it the um, preliminary uh, affidavit, and the, the final, this is a preliminary and a final. What we've done on this, this is construction control document that you already have from the state. All we've done is take it and just change none of the wording from the state, and just added the language about the fire escape and turned this into a, a con control document that the state lets you use on any control doc. Anything uh, that's over 30, what, 34, 35,000 cubic square feet requires uh, construction control, right? So we just took that document. So does that mean every commercial uh, building that we ever examined that's over 35 automatically needs structural engineer? Is that what you're saying here too? I know we got residential. But all of a sudden, as soon as we get over 35,000 cubic square feet, and there's a fire escape inspection and or repair, it doesn't need one of these documents. Is that what the code says? You, you must have control. So that was something that we didn't share the last time. But in our investigation and conversations, we basically said, oh, so that means a preliminary document. And we shared this back to you say, hey, Bob, do you want to include that into your, into your mix? What this means is that uh, during the initial investigation, and it looks like there's repairs that are going to be done on a job, we need somebody to fill out one of these so that it already identifies the vendors, identifies the structural engineer, and that this engineer is in touch with a city official. And they, they're, they're, they're getting a plan together. You know what that plan is? To spot repair that and load test it, or to fully refurbish it to avoid the load test, which is certification. And who's going to decide which way they're going to go? Well, obviously the economics is back to the client. If Spot repairing and load testing is 10, full refurb is 15. Who chooses that? Not the city. The city will accept either one. It's an economic choice by the owner. But sometimes the load testing on the fire escape and the, and the certification is 15, and the, uh, I'm sorry, the, the spot repair and the load testing is 15, but yet the full refurb is 10. And sometimes a full, a brand new one is 20. Galvanized, 40 year. 
So who makes that decision? Not the city official. The owner gets those, but the city says, I got two things I'll accept from you. A low test. So you can spot repair any fire escape you want. Okay? And just you know, low testing is not a big thing. I've only the only low test I've ever done is out in California. But right now, just as of yesterday, we're doing uh, we we inspect 375 fire escapes from Harvard. And they want to do one low, they want to low test one of the small fire escapes just to see what the hell this is. <laughs> You know, and sort of look at the economics of it to say, is it worthwhile on some of the buildings that they're not going to hold in the portfolio to not fully refurbish it at this time? Just let's fix it, let's low test it, and let's give it, let's buy five years. So there's one coming from Massachusetts, and it's actually on some of the Harvard buildings that we're inspecting. But uh, and there's the and there's the final. So if you read this document, and by the way, we recently found out that this document has been changed recently by the state. It has a new look, but it's the same information. So we haven't. Nothing's changed. It's still a construction control document. All we've done is insert just language about fire escapes. That's all we've done. So if anybody wants to check out, needs to have Bob check it out with his legal department, we change we change no language. We change nothing other than insert that this one is more specific to fire escapes. So if you want to use this on every fire escape, here's another thing that will scare an engineer to doing it right, and say, hey, you're inspecting that building. Please provide me with a preliminary affidavit and all your information so we can talk about it. And then I want to know who's going to be paid to oversee. It's called engineer oversight. Three visits, an initial visit to kick off the vendor, a mid-visit to see if he's doing it correctly, a final visit to make sure that it was done correctly, a, a confidence test sign-off, and then what does that vendor do? He calls the city official to do what? Come final inspection. Out of all of you, who's ever done a final inspection on a fire escape? And I don't, I don't mean just Lowell, some of them have done recently, but I'm talking about anybody has ever done a file inspection on a fire escape three years ago, five years ago? Has anybody ever called you for a final inspection on a fire escape? Because the permit was never pulled. This asks for a permit number. <laughs> this, this, this control document is already giving you everything you need to basically close that loophole that's been uh, abused by the uh, vendors, the landscapers, and the florists. Um, guys, this is here is a uh, repair guidelines. You know how you fix a fire escape? Take out the bolt, separate the connection, wire brush it, prime it, put it back together, and if you're doing the right job, encapsulate it with some silicone. That's the repair guideline for every single piece. So if you read this, every piece is told how to fix it, but it all starts with take the bolt out, clean the connection, prime it, seal it with silicone, put the bolt back in. So that's how simple it is to fix one of these things. Doesn't mention any welding. You can weld on fire escapes if you wish. The only problem is it can't have any lead. It has to be fairly new. It has to be a certified welder. And by the way, one year later, in order for me to meet your requirement, what happens to a welded connection that water and moisture got in there and the guy didn't seal it? Is it suspect? And I need to radiograph it or load test it. How about a bolt? that I put in today, five years from today, do I need to load test that bolt for you? Or can I provide you other evidence of strength that five years ago this was a brand new bolt? So the other evidence of strength on average on a properly maintained fire escape will avoid the load test 15 to 25 years. So as long as you keep that thing painted, keep that thing sealed, I'll be able to provide to the city official other evidence of strength. Here's the, here's the certificate. So if you don't want to do it for the, with a new confidence test, here's the Boston certificate. Read right in the middle what it says. To the best of my information, I always believe these egress components are, are in conformity with the provision of the Mass Building Code. It says Section 805, and that's, this is an old certificate, but it's now 1001.3. That's all you have to sign. And by the way, two licenses, right? So you have a Boston license. You know what the other license is? Out of California. Massachusetts urges you a building license of G3. They'll let you sign off on fire escapes in Boston and other cities that allow you. In California, in LA, I have a Reg 4 license issued by a fire prevention. 100 question test, $1,000 fee every three years. You have to not only walk out with a fire prevention marshal, you have to show them how, how you examine, how you uh, write the report. There's all these things that you must do. If not, you can't get your license from fire prevention. Those are the only two licenses to look at fire escapes in the nation. Okay. Let's. Uh, I'm going to go one more. This is all the details of how fire escapes are built. 
Fire escapes have not changed in 100 years. Okay? This here is the drawing of fire escape solutions. So you got all these structural engineers and all these architects out there that are going to give you catwalks over roofs. They're going to give you drawings. So drawing, this is what you expect now when not something on a yellow pad of paper to pull a permit for a new fire escape. You're going to want professional drawings. And this is the tags that, they're, that are in use in, in uh, Seattle. So when you get there, there's a fire escape problem. Okay. The last thing we're going to talk about is we'll go into it at the end, is what steps can you can you create? And some of them are the simple ones. You got a permit, sign off on this, sign off on that. Uh, building the, uh, the fire prevention guys, when you do a smoke detector, what should you be asking for on your list? Here's your smoke detector, sir. Can I have a copy of your fire escape affidavit? They don't have one, give them this, sir. But now you have a, 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 a check mark on yours that says, you got to call the building department that says, I signed this building up, but it's incomplete. I mean, I still gave him a cert for the smoke detector so the guy doesn't freak out and start calling everybody, but you basically identified somebody. So depending on your yearly exams, whatever, put it on a list. Building ins uh, Housing inspectors, same thing. You're ho you've got houses that have you know people living in the second, third floor, and you basically go in and check for lead, check for this, check for that. What do you want to walk out? And we've done, we've, we've done the housing inspector classes, and they're online. So if you go to the National Firescape Association.org, all these classes, this one's being recorded. The last class we did is online. You can actually go online in case somebody missed this class and watch it online. These two, three, four hour classes are online free. If you go to nationalfirescape.org, not only is the class on there, you just click it and you can watch it on your smartphone, your laptop, or at home, but you can also see the name and phone number of Bob. They just want to call and say, hey, is this any good? Worthwhile, okay. So that's what this book is. This is just basically. Well, I don't know if you bought it, but uh, Rennie Shatno here is the uh, director, the director of facilities. Yeah. You know, the local housing authority. They have three thousand units. Uh, yeah. And they have older buildings that have exterior fire escapes. So right. That's why I'm glad he showed up today. And and not just the housing authority, but a lot of people are using Section Eight. So a lot of the private sector is helping on that side. And a lot of people in the private housing sector, they have no clue that the fire escape on their building, which nobody ever asked for certificates on, is even a problem. Okay. So again, all the codes concur. We're going to take a short break in a minute now, so that we can also go back there. But the confidence tests, okay, are very important. Here's the one thing that we like that made a difference. This came out of Tacoma. There's a five-year certificate, but Tacoma created the one-year certificate. And the five-year certificate is by a structural engineer. The one-year certificate is by the building manager, by the building owner. And he has three simple questions. Are the bolts and, and, and supports look pretty good? There's no damage, like not, no trucks have hit it? Is the thing painted and looks like it's in good condition? And then all the moving parts on the fire escape working. There's a lot of come down. There's the doors open. There's the windows open onto the fire escape. Sign. So some, on some of your one-year inspections, guess what you get from the building department? I mean, from the management company or the owner of the building. Now this is the greatest thing for the fire guys or the building guys when they have something that goes over a roof, because they have those goosenecks over the roof. So you tell the man, the manager of the building, say, hey, I like to use, I like to see this thing in operation for the one-year certificate. Can you have your maintenance guy go to the roof, climb over, come down? The the, the staircase and activate the cantilever and drop it for me. And as soon as they go, what? <laughs> and there's a problem with the fire escape. You know now, they can hire anybody to do this. So they can hire an engineer to do that process. They can hire uh, a local inspection company to come and perform that for them. But a stunt it, man. A stunt man. <laughs> well, this is what this does is basically puts a little burden on the ownership to basically, uh, on a one year inspections, make sure that their fire escapes are in good order. But every five years, it's a professional that's going to verify that everything is structural. So a lot more people, after they've had their fire escape certified, are going to be able to do this one year. But now, nobody's doing one year. Until you have a five year done and you're certified, you can't perform one year. But as a test on a lot of your commercial buildings, since you have one year inspections for other things, you should have them basically test drive the fire escape system to make sure it's fully functional. Which they're supposed to do anyway, but this forces them to do it. Okay? So what I want to do right now is, um, we talked about the tags, and this is what in Lowell, uh, I mean in Seattle, you have to have the white tag, and I think I have a picture here of, of one of the tags in, in play. So this is, in Seattle, they want 19 by 11 tags. So there's a red one, a yellow one, and it's very clear, 
for a fireman. When he gets there, fire escape is out of service, so it's color coded. But also when when they pass, they have a white one with all the names on it, including who fixed it, what's their phone numbers, who's the engineer, so a lot of the information is all on the tag. Okay? So let me show you what a typical tag looks like and we'll, and we'll end it here. But this is a typical tag that has the name of the company, license numbers of who did what. Okay? So if I, what, I, what time is it now? It's about 10, 10, 15? It is uh, 10.20. Let's take a, let's take a, let's say, five to 10 minute break so you guys can refill your coffees. I'm going to go back here now and just hang out by the fire escape. I'm just going to start talking about it. So if any of you want to make a phone call or do anything else, we'll, we'll, we'll continue with this because we have a two hour class and some of you are going to leave. Uh, how many are here for the two? How many are here for the four? Okay, so again, I'll, I'll let's take a little break. Let's uh, re refresh your coffees and uh, I'll be back here and, and I'll talk about the fire escape over here. You guys that don't know the this hall is uh, not too many bathrooms. If you go out here and take a lap, there's a men's room and on the lower level. You ready for it? Uh,